Hello, I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. Welcome to my dark little corner of the universe. Here we discuss all things horrific, both paranormal and human, with a twist of humor thrown in from time to time, because everything goes better with humor. Don't you agree? Tonight, we will focus on the ghostly stories, two haunted houses, an unseen visitor, and a garden that holds more than meets the eye. So sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. Growing up, I absolutely hated being home. At night, it always sounded like someone was walking around, and there were whispers from my closet whenever it was left open. I always made sure that the closet was closed before bed, but most mornings when I'd wake up, it was partially opened. I refused to go into the basement even during the day, and you could never escape the feeling of somebody or something watching you. I'm talking full on blankets over your head or pulled up to your face with just your nose poking out type of childhood. One night, we had a powerful thunderstorm roll through. I remember it vividly because the lightning was near constant and instead of white and blue, the colors were more purple and green. The storm took our power out. My father asked me to go into the kitchen and help gather some candles and flashlights. I was walking down the dark hallway when something jumped out at me from the bathroom. Thinking it was my father trying to scare me, I laughed and said, nice try. There was a loud growl and my father put his hand on my shoulder from behind me and pulled me back into the living room, closed and locked the door, the whole time saying it wasn't him and he saw it too. The growling continued from the kitchen entryway for a good 10 minutes, and it sounded like something was pacing up and down the hallway. Dad and I spent the night in the living room. We didn't sleep. We just watched the door. We moved a few months later. The new house we moved into felt good. It felt like, finally, I could sleep without the blankets over my head. Years later, when my father was diagnosed with cancer, we started watching the various ghost shows on cable TV. That got us talking about that night and what we saw. It wasn't until then that my father revealed that the house I grew up in was an old renovated funeral home. Before the house was renovated, the closet in my bedroom was the location for the lift that brought the bodies from the basement embalming room up to the viewing room on the main level. That floor was the funeral director's private living space. My father's aunt actually owned the house and lived in it on the first floor, which was the floor where they did all the viewings and such. Talking with my cousins, they said they had similar experiences of hearing scratching in the walls, footsteps, banging in the basement, and that lights would come on as if they were all connected in a series, rather than each light having its own circuit. They even told me that they wouldn't go into the basement alone either because the stairs go right past a walk-in storage room that had no lights. And they swore they heard breathing and growling when they walked past. They have since moved from that house. Update. A few folks wanted to know if I had any more experiences to share of growing up in what I would later find out was an old funeral home. Why, yes. Yes, I do. We lived there for 13 years, from 1977 to 1990. It wasn't until after the incident with the storm in 1990 that my father decided it was time to move. I made a note of every experience we had, individually and as a family, in a journal. I'll go room by room. I should note here that I wasn't allowed in my parents' bedroom, for obvious reasons but I was able to debunk those particular noises once the teenage years set in. My parents had a very healthy relationship. Okay, strap in, this will be long. These things happened in every room. 
cold spots and odd smells were common throughout the house. We attributed that to the old steam radiator heaters. There was always scratching in the walls at night. There were no rats or vermin, no insect activity or plumbing issues. Dad was a maintenance foreman. He checked everything out. Also of note, there were no trees close enough to the house to have made those noises. You always felt like you were being watched. None of my friends ever stayed over or even wanted to come inside. They always said the house creeped them out. Now, on to each specific room. The entryway. The interior door for the entryway was wood with glass panes. This opened up to a stairwell that led down to the main floor. The entryway door was always locked at night. The door had an old hook and latch style closure. It was very secure, but on many occasions, my father would find the door slightly opened or completely opened when he got up in the morning. Sometimes, if it was early enough in the night, you could even hear the click from the latch as it was opened by itself. The hallway runner was always bunched up, even though the door cleared it easily. The bathroom. This is the room that that thing jumped out from into the hallway during the storm. You never entered that bathroom in the dark. Almost the entire back of the door was covered by a mirror. People avoided looking into that mirror because it never felt right. You could see shadows moving in the mirror's reflection, but when you turn around, nothing was there. But we couldn't take the mirror down as it was basically painted into place. And the thought of breaking the mirror always made you feel nauseous or sick. The kitchen. Cabinets would open and close on their own, and the bell for the toaster would go off at odd times, even if the toaster was off or unplugged. The dining room. The main light over the table used a bright white incandescent light bulb, but at times, the light would turn on and appear to be dim, like the old-fashioned light bulbs. At night, you could often hear the old push-button switch getting pushed in on its own because the click was very loud and distinctive. The pantry. This room always skeeved me out. It was like a walk-in closet for dry goods. As soon as you entered, you felt like bugs were crawling all over you, but there were never any bugs in sight. No spiders, nothing. Also, you made your selection rather quickly because you always felt like something was about to drop on you from above. Very unsettling. The sunroom. For Christmas one year, my father gave me a Fonzie pinball machine. You know, from the old TV show Happy Days. It was kept unplugged when not in use. But even then, on a few occasions, you could hear the sound of the flippers or the ball running up and down the game field. Dad thought the game was malfunctioning. It wasn't. We also had an electronic bowling game out there. Sometimes the ball would roll around the room at night by itself. The game played music, the ride of the Valkyries, if you got a strike. Even when we weren't playing, the music would go off at odd times and off speed. The attic. Now the cool thing about the attic, the former funeral director had a full bar and billiard table up there along with a guest room. How he got all that stuff up there is a mystery because the attic entryway was super narrow. Oddly, the attic was calm. Who knew the cure for haunting was booze and pool? I remember a wood carving just past the door that depicted Ireland and etched in the wood was written in Gaelic, Ireland watches over those who cross this threshold. When we moved, we took that wood carving with us, with permission. I'm only the third generation in the family who wasn't born in Ireland. My dad hung it on our front door of our new house. Well, thank you all for taking the time to read. When I was eight years old, my family moved into a haunted house. It wasn't an old house, and as far as I know, no one died there. It didn't even feel creepy. It was just your average suburban house in your average suburban neighborhood. 
I was my mother's only child, and my half-brother and sister didn't live with us and rarely came to visit. The first time anything really happened in the house was when I lost my last baby tooth. Being a kid, I expected a visit from the tooth fairy, so when I woke up in the middle of the night and saw a figure standing in my room, I just assumed it was the tooth fairy. It was bald, about three or four feet tall, the size of an average child, and standing completely still, just looking at me. I remembered my parents telling me that if I was awake, the tooth fairy wouldn't leave me any money, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next morning, I excitedly told my parents that I'd seen the tooth fairy the night before. I described what I had seen, but they told me it was just a dream. For several years, I continued seeing and hearing things in the house. When I was home alone, cabinet doors would open and close on their own, and I'd hear dishes being moved around in the kitchen, or catch movement out of the corner of my eye. The most common thing was, at night, I'd wake up to see a young woman hovering over my bed. When I would see her, she'd stare down at me for a while, then slowly float over my body and out through the wall behind me. I was never afraid of her, though. When I was around 12, my parents divorced and it was just me and Mom living in the house. By the time I was in my late teens, Mom was rarely home, and my house became the hangout for all my friends. Most nights, everyone gathered at my place to play Dungeons and Dragons. One night, I wanted to do something a little different, so I pulled out a Ouija board that I'd picked up in a toy store a few weeks before. We sat in my room with the lights out, lit a candle, closed the door, put our fingers on the planchette, and began asking questions. We asked if anyone is there, please show yourself. Moments later, we heard the front door open and close, and heavy footsteps come down the hall towards my room. The handle on my door started to turn, and one of the guys jumped up and locked the door before it could open. We didn't hear anything else, no footsteps moving away from the door, nothing. After a while, we turned on the lights and opened the door to see if maybe my mother had come home unexpectedly. The house was empty, and the front door locked. We decided we'd had enough of the game at that point, and put it away, and everyone went home. A few weeks later, we were hanging out at my house again, playing Dungeons and Dragons. One of the girls that usually came had to work late, so she didn't come. While we were sitting in the living room playing, around two in the morning, we heard footsteps run across the front porch. It sounded like someone very small running very quickly. Everyone in the room heard it, and we wondered if our friend had changed her mind and come after all. She was very short, and it made much more sense that she was out there, rather than a small neighbor's child running around at that time of night. When no one knocked on the door, we all got up to look outside, but there was no one there, and our friend's car wasn't around. Her boyfriend, who was with us, gave her a call and verified that it wasn't her. She'd just arrived home on the other side of town and was headed to bed. The activity in the house picked up after that. I saw a shadow figure with red eyes in the living room and heard footsteps and other noises at all hours of the day and night. I'd wake up in my room to see hooded figures standing by my window. It was around this time that my half-brother passed away. His death was sudden. I hadn't seen him in years as he'd gotten involved in drugs, and my mother decided to keep me away. She didn't want him to be a bad influence on me. After he died, I'd hear his voice calling my name in the middle of the night. We had been rather close as kids, and I really missed him. So on a whim one night, I sat down and typed out a letter to him on my computer. The computer was hooked up to one of those old dot matrix printers. You know, the ones that are really loud and make a racket when they're printing? After I wrote the letter, I felt silly for doing it, and deleted it without saving it or printing it out, and shut down the computer before going to bed. Around three in the morning, I woke up and my bed was soaking wet. At first I thought my puppy had an accident, even though he was housebroken and I'd taken him out just before bed. 
I got up to let him outside and change the bed sheets when I realized that the wet was just water. On my way to get new sheets from the laundry room, I passed by the bathroom in the hallway and noticed the light was on, even though I had turned out all the lights before going to bed. There, sitting on the counter, was a pitcher from the kitchen with the inside still wet. When I was very young, my brother used to wake me up in the morning by throwing water on me because he thought it was hilarious. When I got back into my room and started making my bed, I noticed a piece of paper lying on top of the printer. It was the letter that I had written to him and never saved or printed out. The computer was still shut down and the printer was off, but it had been printed out, torn off the printer and put on top as if someone had read it. Things like that continued on for a few years and seemed to escalate. The hooded figures appeared more often. I'd wake in the night feeling like I was being watched. One night, I rolled over and saw what looked like a face without eyes lying next to me in bed. I screamed and it disappeared, and the room was so cold I could see my breath, and this on a hot summer night. When I was in my early 20s, I moved out for good, but I had one final experience in that house, and it was terrifying. My mother hadn't been to the house in months and was preparing to sell it. I told one of my cousins about all the things that had happened there through the years, and he decided that he and his friend would pick me up and go ghost hunting while the house was empty. We each had a camera and my cousin brought a voice recorder. We set the recorder in my old bedroom and spent about an hour wandering around the house taking pictures. When we were done, we went back to my room to listen to the recording. On the recording, we could hear our voices getting louder or softer as we moved through the house. About 20 minutes into the recording, a voice that sounded as if it were right up against the microphone said, Get out! We immediately complied. I am done with that place for good. One night, back when I was 12 or 13, back in the 90s, I was home alone. I was sitting on my couch reading with my dog lying next to me when she suddenly leapt to her feet and bolted into the kitchen. I thought she just needed to go outside, so I followed her. When I rounded the corner, she was standing at the back door with her ears back, hackles up, and teeth bared. She was making that super deep, low growling sound that dogs make when they're in defense mode and about to attack a threat. That don't mess with me growl. She was super alert and wouldn't take her eyes off that door. Now she was normally the most chill, calm dog I'd never seen her act this way, so her behavior really put me on edge. I could see the door was locked from where I was, and that was good, since whenever I tried to approach the door to look out the window, she would move her body to block the way between me and whatever it was that was out there. I gently scooted her butt over, figuring it was probably just a small animal or something that she smelled outside. She was a beagle mix, and they have great noses. I flipped on the back deck lights and peered out. Nothing was there. I could see the entire deck. There were no blind spots. As I was looking, trying to figure out what on earth was making her freak out so much, there was an extremely loud bang on the door. The glass rattled in the window so hard I thought it would break. I screamed and my dog went nuts. It sounded like a fist had smashed into the wood part of the door from the outside with a deep rage behind it. I had been staring at the empty spot at the foot of the door when it happened. Nothing was there. I checked the lock again, locked the basement door, the front door, and every window in the house. I then dragged my still snarling dog back into my bedroom and hugged her until my parents got home. She growled the entire time and wouldn't leave my side until morning. I've never been able to explain it. Our pets can see and sense things that we can't, 
so always heed their warnings. Back when I was a freshman in high school, I was part of a choir that would sing only school-approved songs, like the national anthem or church hymns. To be honest, I wasn't the best singer and only joined for the benefit of skipping class. The skipping class part was great, but staying late for practice was kind of a downside, especially when it was right before a big school event. One day, we had to practice in a room near the school's botanical gardens because the place where we usually practiced was being occupied by another group of people. Some of the members of the choir were kind of hesitant about practicing near the gardens because there had been a lot of creepy stories surrounding the place, and no two accounts were the same. I, on the other hand, just wanted practice to be over. We sang until around 9 p.m., and by that time, there were only two gates open if you wanted to leave the school grounds. The college gate, which was all the way across campus from where we were practicing, or the track and field gate, which was nearby, but you had to pass through the botanical gardens to get there. Me, being a lazy guy, decided to take the shortest route through the gardens, while the others wished me luck and went in the opposite direction. I believe that any place can be creepy as long as it's dark, and the botanical gardens were no exception. I got out my phone to call my parents and let them know that I was done. It rang once before being answered. I talked into the phone, telling my parents where to pick me up, but no reply. I stopped the call and called again. Same thing, no reply. I called for a third time to ask them to pick me up, almost shouting at this point into the phone, but still, no reply. Finally, I gave up and decided to text them. After walking through the garden for a couple of minutes, I finally reached my destination without incident. It was a creepy walk, but I was kind of relieved that nothing out of the ordinary happened. After about 15 minutes of waiting, my parents arrived, but something was off. When the car stopped in front of me, they both jumped out and asked me if I was okay, with very worried expressions on their faces. I said I was fine and asked them what was up. They told me that they got all of my calls, so I asked them why they hadn't answered me. They said the only thing they heard was my voice saying, help me, help me, over and over again. Fun fact, the part of the story about joining the choir as an excuse for skipping class resonated with me. In grade school, I joined the school band just so I could skip math class as band practice fell during that hour. I chose the flute only because it was the easiest instrument to carry, and I never even learned how to play. I even played in a concert, just moving my fingers and blowing air, and the band teacher never noticed. One day, when I went back to math class after practice, the teacher called me up to do an equation at the board, and she reprimanded me when I couldn't do it. I said, but I wasn't here. I was at band practice when you taught how to do this. But she told me that was no excuse. I wanted to say, uh, how is not being here to learn the lesson not an excuse? But being that it was a Catholic school, I just politely apologized and took my seat. Even your daughter of darkness knows better than to mess with a Catholic nun. I still suck at math to this day, and bonus fail? I still can't play the flute. Well, that brings us to the end. Let me know in the comments section below if you enjoyed these stories, and introduce yourself while you're at it, so that we can get to know one another. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends.